Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the webinar for the China. Thanks so much for being here today, and I will share some of his as the key drivers for the China market this year. After which, I will talk to the Lion OCBC Securities China and illustrate how investors like yourself may be positioned to capitalize on the growth wave of China. Without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Yun to run us through his China outlook for this year. Hello, hi everybody. Uh, thank you very much for having me here today. Uh, I'm uh, Lim Yun, uh, the uh, Chief Investment Strategist at uh, Lion Global Investors. Um, today, I'm going to run through uh, our outlook of uh, the China uh, market itself. And uh, as you, everybody probably knows, there's a lot of uh, so-called macro events out there. Uh, and as such, you know, um, you know the so-called the market, the Chinese market, uh, the equities market outlook could actually be influenced by a lot of these macro events. So maybe let let me uh, bring you through, and uh, and also just a reminder, you know, this is not a recommendations for people to actually to to invest or to to buy at a particular timing. Uh, what we are trying to do is actually to share with investors our ideas and and what our knowledge over here, so that you can actually make. Uh, your best uh, so-called uh, re relevant uh, decisions, investment decisions. Um, so here, you know, uh, just an introduction of myself. I'm the chief investment strategist here at Light Global Investors. Uh, 15 years in the so-called the, uh, the, uh, the markets, equity markets itself, three years in the sell side and another, you know, uh, 12 to 13 years in uh, Lion Global. And uh, before that, I, I was actually in the Singapore Economic Development Board. Uh, both in uh, Singapore and also in Tokyo as a center director and also worked as a first uh, first secretary of the Singapore Embassy in, in Tokyo itself. So a diverse uh, experience uh, over here. Hope you know, my experience can actually uh, help to share uh, the so-called uh, our best uh, information to investors. Uh, just before that, a little bit of a introduction to our firm i think a lot of you guys would uh would, would be actually familiar with us lion global investors is actually uh, part of the ocbc group uh, we've been around for quite a long time 35 years over here in singapore um with uh, 72 billion singapore dollars in term in terms of asset under management um over here we have around uh, 50 dedicated investment professionals so we are actually uh, active uh, uh, so-called uh, fund managers and analysts for myself uh, my experience here in uh, Line Global uh, would include the uh, uh, as an analyst and also co-fund manager for the Japan Equities Fund, and also a, as a fund manager before I became the chief investment strategist uh, of uh, this uh, global disruptive innovation fund here in, in uh, at uh, LGI at Line Global. Uh, so as you probably know, you know over the years, you know we have been around, and uh, over the last few years especially. Uh, we are very glad to be recognized by a lot of uh, the so-called the agencies out there. And uh, we have won uh, many awards over the last 17 years. So without uh, much further ado, you know, let, let me actually bring everybody to the so-called our market outlook uh, for China itself. But before that, just now, like I mentioned, you know, I think you know, sometimes when you want to look forward, you know, it's, it's actually easier or sometimes it's better for you to also to look at what actually happened or transpired over the last uh, few years. So the equity markets itself now currently is in a very special uh, position, not only because of the Ukraine-Russia conflict itself, but also because, you know, we have just in a way uh, recovered or, you know, we are not totally recovered, right? But we are in a transition towards the end of a, of a COVID um, so-called pandemic itself. So as you look over here in this chart, what I want to bring to everybody's attention uh, is that the equity returns for the last three years has been fantastic. This is despite the fact that in 2020, you know, we actually have COVID, uh, which is a, a major uh, problem uh, causing a lot of countries to actually to shut down, including Singapore. And we are now still in the midst of, a, you know, it's a slight partial shutdown. But in 2022 itself, you know, I think what would happen is that probably, you know, we will move into a post-COVID world. So if you look at uh, the equity returns over here in this chart, I think the first line, first row shows the uh, MSCI uh, world index itself. You look at it, you know, it's really 
decent returns, right? You know, 2019, such decent return. 2020, despite COVID, was still up 16%. 2021, 18%, and, and so on and so forth. Um, and, and then if you look at the individual uh, countries or let's say regions itself, US had the best performance, right? Um, 2019, 2020, 2021, no 20% and above. Um, in terms of uh, returns itself, Europe also decent, Asia, um, well, it's quite good, 19, 2019, 2020, but 2021, you know, the market actually corrected. I think the reasons of, behind that was because of China. So over here, I've highlighted MSCI China, right? You can look at different indices for China and come to, the numbers are different because of the, the weightings, or the, the indice, uh, weightings or, or the components inside it. But then again, it's, it's about the same direction, right? So you look at 2019, 2020, really good returns, but 2021, you know, the Chinese market actually corrected uh, quite sharply. So this actually forms a backdrop, right? So if you look over here, just bear something in mind. World equity markets have done very well over the last three years, right? Except for China last year. So I think this is a key takeaway for everybody. So this actually sets the backdrop uh, against all the other things that, or, or the, the macro events that actually happens. And then that, that will actually uh, have a bearing on the so-called the outlook for the Chinese market itself. I just, okay, so I just want to tell everybody that um, over here, I think if you look at 2022, I created these slides, you know, a, a couple of weeks, a few weeks ago, that's before the, the conflict in the in a Ukraine actually escalated to such an extent, you know, it's most unfortunate uh, over there. So, you know, uh, it's too late for me to include this because of compliance purposes, but there are actually a few themes over here in 2022 that investors should look out for. And probably, you know, this would decide, you know, the so-called the general direction of the market itself, including China. So the three main themes for the market itself are, first, is actually COVID-19 and it's, uh, you know, what are the remaining effects of COVID-19. So in, in China's perspective, I think it has actually navigated or controlled the pandemic fairly well. So in 2020, 2020 it didn't really shut down for so long. Uh, but the Chinese market has actually, the Chinese government has actually maintained a sort of like a zero COVID uh, policy itself. But, you know, if you look at uh, the, the China itself, until today, you know, for a lot of us, we, we cannot travel travel to China. And likewise, they cannot easily travel out. So um, is, is 2020, 2022 going to be different from them? You know, um, would they actually exit the so-called the zero COVID um, so-called strategy itself? Is, you know, I, I guess we don't have a crystal ball over here, but later I'll explain that, um, you know, what, what we are thinking about. So this is something for the market to think about. And the reason why COVID-19 is still important, some people might say, oh, we talk about it in 2020, 2021, and now 2022, now I'm bored about it, but I am bored of it. But the reality is that COVID-19 actually, you know, does impact the market and exiting of COVID-19 also would actually impact the market. The second you know, theme to, to look out for is actually quantitative ease, easing or the re reverse of it and also hiking of interest rates uh, globally. So that includes in the US. Um, but the the flip side is actually when the whole world is actually tightening, you know, especially in the US, I think. But if you look at China, China is actually on the reverse of it. It's actually easing. So this is something that will actually impact the market itself. And lastly, um, I think most importantly, you know, in, in China would be the, the question of whether the Chinese government is done with the so-called introduction of new regulations into the market itself and what the common prosperity policies that they have put in place, what does that actually mean for the market? So remember, you know, just now I mentioned the Chinese market actually corrected last year, right? You know, while the rest of the market actually had a, you know, had a very good performance. So does that actually, you know, if the reverse of that would mean that, you know, the Chinese market could actually do very well. There are actually three other longer term themes that are out there. Uh, one, which is actually inflation, runaway inflation. I think everybody knows about, you know, inflation is very getting very high in US, in Singapore, headline inflation over here in January is around 4%. Um, a lot of us actually feeling the pinch of that, but uh, actually inflation is not such a big issue in China. Uh, second thing is actually decarbonization. These are the longer theme themes that were also impact the Chinese market, i.e., you know, the Chinese government has also pledged to actually to control the amount of uh, carbon that it emits into the, in, into the uh, atmosphere itself. And that has some implications uh, on the sectors that are investable. And lastly, uh, obviously, if you talk about um, long-term trends, then you cannot run away from disruptive innovation. 
uh, of course the innovative companies disruptive innovative companies have actually corrected uh, together with global uh, global tech stocks uh, likewise in china i think a lot of the the so-called tech names uh, or the disruptive names have actually corrected quite sharply also because of the, the regulations itself but I, I, but I want to emphasize that actually in the very long run, uh, in the long run itself, what I mean long run would be in the two, three years, four years time frame, disruptive innovation is, is here to stay and this uh, is where investment opportunities are. Oops. Okay, so here, um, I just want to show everybody um, the vaccination rate globally. So I got these uh, numbers from uh, the so-called the uh, Our World in Data. Uh, you can also go over there and you can click on and see what is the vaccination rate. And you also have a lot of uh, other data uh, pertaining to, let's say, you know, um, the number of uh, COVID cases and so on and so forth. But just one chart over here, I just want to show everybody that in China, despite them saying that, oh, no, we want to have a zero COVID uh, policy, I think the main uh, thing that people have to, to remember is this, that once the vaccination rate reaches a very high level, so in, in, in Singapore's level, 90% and above or, so, or, or thereabout, I think the governments would eventually have to say that, you know, we want to uh, reopen, meaning that we want to live with uh, COVID. So likewise in Singapore, I think a lot of us would be familiar with uh, the communications from our ministers, and that would be that, you know, with three vaccination, meaning with the booster shot itself, the chances of getting serious uh, illness from COVID will actually be quite low. And as such, you know, if you weigh the pros and cons, I think it's a, it's a quite a easy choice for them. And uh, that would mean that it will open up the economy and then actually uh, allow uh, life to, to go back to normal. Likewise, for China's case, um, the if you look at the chart over here, second uh, row, you, you can actually see that in China, the vaccination rate is also very high, 88%. So here lies the issue, right? Whereby I think the communication from China is still zero COVID um, and the market actually prices that in, right? Meaning that China wouldn't open. Can you imagine if China were to actually to announce and say that, you know, now that the vaccination rate is high enough, you know, it's about time for us to open up. I guess, you know, this is not priced in, uh, that would actually cause, a, you know, that would be a positive catalyst for the market itself. Sec you know, with this COVID and whatever that's happening in Ukraine and Russia and what have you, I've actually extracted so-called the GDP growth forecast uh, globally. So if you look at the last column, 2022, this is where the, the numbers are um, most important. You look at US, you look at U uh, EU, you look at Japan and China. If you look at the numbers over here, they're still fairly decent. Of course, uh, with the current conflict in, uh, in uh, Ukraine, uh, and uh, the issues over there, I think it would probably uh, impact the uh, European Union um, much more than the other countries or the other regions that are geographically further away. So what that means is that uh, over here, you probably could see a little bit of a downgrade to the GDP forecast, but not by much for most of the, uh, the, the regions out there, except for Europe, which over here says 4%, but internally we, we think that it could be closer to 3.5% or, or thereabout. But that said, the GDP numbers are still fairly strong, right? You know, if you look at uh, the numbers over here and you compare over a five year or even a 10 years time frame, the GDP growth forecast for 2022 is actually on the high side, which means that despite, um, you know, whatever disruptions that we get from COVID itself uh, and also the disruption from the Ukraine side, um, well, the GDP growth rate for 2022 is still fairly high. So which bought well for the equity markets itself. So that actually allows uh, companies to, to have uh, uh, good uh, earnings. Um, second thing that I just want to tell uh, everybody is this, right? That uh, I think the Chinese market has actually corrected quite sharply for last year. And I, I think one of the reasons behind that was later, I'm going to explain uh, the Chinese actually um, are tightening in their policies itself. That's in line with uh, what they communicated to everybody uh, in their um, in in their communication. They actually mentioned that you know they want to have a regulatory uh, tightening. Basically, what that means is that they want to have structural reform in the in in the economy itself. So I actually wanted to extract um, the so-called the keywords that the Chinese communicate. Remember, China is a planned economy, right? So the the Chinese government they have a very good track record you know, uh, in actually uh, 
uh, delivering what they, they they are planning to to deliver right it's their target itself so over the last uh, let's say if you if you if you take a, a look over the last 10 years itself um i over here you know i just want to extract for every year the chinese government actually would you know in, in, as part of the communication to the local governments and actually basically is is a national agenda right they will tell uh, the the whole country that you know this is what we are aiming for so there are certain years whereby you know they see the economy has actually sort of like grown too fast there are some um shall i say you know instability in the system itself there are some risks in the system itself and they will introduce uh, let's say you know regulatory tightening uh, rebalancing reforms and what have you and if you look at the chart over here i think this is a uh, one of the most important uh, the slide in, in my presentation you will notice that in years where they talk about regulatory tightening they talk about uh, uh, reforms the market tends not to do very well right <laughs> obviously right because those are the years whereby they will put in place policies to um, you know be, uh, should i say you know to to de deleverage uh, certain industry uh, to and it actually causes you know the the, the profit margins of uh, certain comp companies to actually be lower than than uh, what it used to be and uh, that will actually be reflected in market performances so over in over years including 2021 where you know the government basically tells everybody that we are doing tightening we are doing structural reform we, we, we want to do uh, re, uh, SOE, SOE reforms the market tends to sell off but that's said, right? In 2022, after a terrible uh, performance last year, in the uh, end of uh, December 2021, which basically means that they set the tone or they set the policy for 2022, the keywords that they are talking about is actually stability. What that means is that now, instead of regulatory tightening, the government is looking for stability, uh, or should I say growth, you know, as they, they, they want to actually defend a certain um, level of economic growth. And what is the number some people might ask is probably, you know, um, around the 5% level. So, so we believe that, you know, uh, this year is a year whereby the Chinese government will be um, prioritizing growth vis-a-vis -vis, uh, deleveraging or structural reforms. So which means that it actually bodes well for the Chinese market. Um, Second thing, just how I actually mentioned, right? Um, sec the, the number two key uh, story that investors should look out for is actually basically the withdrawal of liquidity from the global uh, equities market. So what that means is that, you know, if you think over the last uh, two years or so because of uh, COVID, a lot of governments out there, basically what they do is that they did was that they lower interest rate in US, they did the, what, what we call quantitative easing, which basically means that the government purchases bonds from the market and that actually injects cash or liquidity into the system itself and uh well they lowered uh, rates the governments could also introduce uh, fiscal spending and so on and so forth so that has done well for the you know that has actually propped up the market so in the uh, us the federal reserve or the us uh, central bank has actually you know done the qe yes actually uh, lower interest rate but 2022 is a year whereby everything is going to reverse so what that means is that, you know, uh, you would have probably heard uh, in the news itself um, about uh, quantitative e uh, uh, tightening, uh, and also you, you would have heard about the, the terms tapering being used. What that means is that the, the U.S. government or U.S. central bank would actually purchase less bonds, less assets, which means that there will be less uh, cash or liquidity that's injected into the system itself. And that's probably going to end sometime this year, uh, probably uh maybe you know in a in a period of march april to to june that there, there about and uh from june is uh, from march itself there's all these talks that the central government is going to start hiking interest rate right so 25 basis point which means that 0 0.25 uh, percent i think that's the so-called the expectation uh rate hike in uh in march and subsequently six times for for this year itself um this is what the market is actually expecting and Basically, the last last thing that the you know people are anticipating is that there's even this thing called uh, quantitative tightening. Basically, what that means is that the government instead of just stop stopping liquidity, ex excess liquidity from getting into the system itself, they are actually taking liquidity out of the system. So what that that means is that you know this could actually be a so called a headwind for equities uh, returns. And basically, I just want to do this. You know, uh, should I say you know? 
a comparison, right? So what you see in the US is probably uh, something that is fairly similar in a, a lot of uh, countries out there in Europe. Um, same thing, you know, ECB is talking about that in Japan, likewise. You know, in Singapore, you know, we are also tightening over here. The only, or should I say, you know, the very rare place that, that is actually on the reverse of that is actually China. The reason behind that is because China never needed to boost the, the economy in 2020. The, the reason behind that was because they controlled COVID very well. And as a result, um, China didn't need to, 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 to loosen. And instead, you know, they were actually tightening last year to actually to do the structural reform. So this year in 2022, China has all the ammunition and they have already communicated that they are on the easing cycle. So what, what could people actually expect uh, over here could be further uh, triple R cuts. Basically, that means uh, the banks would have more liquidity. Uh, second thing, they could actually cut the so-called the lending rate, which meaning no, in China, that means that, you know, it's interest rate cut, right? Uh, they can also increase the bank loan the quota, meaning that banks can actually lend more to corporates or to individuals. And that will actually be, well, positive for risk asset. And if the economy actually slows down even further because of uh, macro events or what have you, the Chinese government actually has got a lot of uh, tools to it, a, a lot of uh, policies to actually to, to tap into. So, for example, they could actually loosen uh, property measures over there or they could also introduce fiscal spending. So you see, the whole world has already used up all its ammunition and is now on a tightening cycle, but China is on the reverse of that. They are actually loosening. Next, I just want to show everybody, uh, last year, you know, when the market was actually selling off, there was actually a, a whole list of uh, so-called new regulations that were put in place, and that actually basically introduced uncertainty uh, into certain sectors like the tech sectors in, in China. And that actually led to the Chinese uh, tech stocks being sold off. And uh, that also contributed to the Chinese equity markets having a correction. So over here, I just show uh, MSCI China price index and for last year and going back into 2020. I just want to show some of the so-called key events that actually happened. Um, I think a lot of us will actually remember or have anticipated the end financials IPO uh, that was actually abolished in uh, November of 2020 and people got uh, a little bit worried. Uh, then subsequently in February of uh, last year, you know, the Chinese government talks about antitrust, meaning that anti-monopoly laws uh, Alibaba was also fined for such violations. Titi Chu Sing, uh, which is like our Grab equivalent, you know, remember they were their apps were actually removed their app, app stores for certain violations, and then they also tightened on you know online gaming for minors and so on and so forth. So there's whole list of uh, new regulations that the Chinese government has actually introduced last year, and that actually led to the sell off in the tech sector. And obviously, um, we are all aware that the the Chinese government has also uh, talked about this common prosperity policy and that's, that has actually spooked uh, market uh, yeah, investors. Uh, the reason behind that is because I think, you know, some of the Western commentators could have actually misunderstood uh, the intentions of the Chinese government by saying that, oh, common prosperity means, you know, common, right? The word means that you want to dis redistribute wealth that's uh, socialist. That means that, you know, it definitely would be bad for corporate uh, earnings. Uh, that would be bad for uh, investors, right? But actually, you know, I think they, they misunderstood the government. When they say common prosperity, there are actually two parts of that. Uh, basically, common wealth is actually to to have a, a, a more, uh, shall I say, uh, a more equitable uh, growth itself. So common meaning that it's redistribution of wealth so that everybody actually benefits in a, uh, in the up cycle. And prosperity means that not only do they want to redistribute wealth, but they also want to grow the, the big the pie itself. So i.e., you know, there's uh, this idea that the Chinese government uh, is actually introducing a lot of these regulations such that they can have a greater income and more equitable growth, meaning that it's fairer for everybody. So basically, you know, in, in this uh, environment, there'll be certain industries that uh, will face uh, new regulations, for example, the platform uh, companies, property, you know, to prevent them from uh, having too much leverage so that they do not uh, create a bubble in the property market and so on and so forth. But that said, right, I think the, the, the base case is that the Chinese government, what they are doing is actually structural reform so that in the end, you know, the, the economy is in a better shape to actually to grow further. So over here, we, we think that it's basically is 
2021 is basically a year whereby they are introducing all these to rebalance or to to structurally reform the the economy itself and 2022 like just now i initially introduced to everybody um they are now focusing on stability which means that they could have seen we could have actually seen a peak in new regulations and second thing the chinese government could actually be now be satisfied that a lot of these uh, reforms or these uh, restrictions that they have put in place are adequate and as such no uh, they can actually move forward to focus on growth itself um just now i've actually mentioned right so these are the three so-called um, stories or events that will, will, will um, affect the market itself there are also three other um, so-called long long-term factors so the first one is actually inflation I think you know everybody knows in US the inflation is very high, it's 40 years high, right? Uh, so I think in January it's uh, around seven and a half percent in terms of uh, of uh, inflation year on year growth. In Singapore it's around four percent, it's also very high. Uh, but actually, you know, in China, inflation numbers are actually quite mild or actually quite low. So in a sense, you know, this high inflation story that we all hear about is is not so much of a problem with the uh, Chinese market. That's it, right? Um, over here, I think in Singapore, in US, there's all these uh, all these uh, questions about whether you know inflation will eventually be uh, higher for longer. I think uh, we actually summarize it over here, um, basically that inflation is high now currently, but it will ease off to to a level that's higher than pre-COVID. So the reasons behind that is because there are some short-term factors that have actually caused inflation or current inflation to be high so these are the supply chain disruptions from COVID itself and second thing you know the high energy prices so basically that what that means is actually oil, oil price um, but that said right these short-term uh, so-called factors will actually ease off once you know we we go into a post-COVID world and second thing you know these high energy prices will ease off in the future despite the conflicts in the in uh, Russia and Ukraine itself the reason behind that is because there's no shortage or there's no supply shortage of oil in the system itself. Um, there's this fear currently, and that's why oil prices have actually shot up. But you know, OPEC plus itself could actually um, increase the production itself. In US, they also can in increase production through shale. And with that, you know, the supply and demand will basically ease off. So over here, I think the expectation is that uh, oil prices will come off and they will not be uh, a contributor or big major contributor to higher inflation in the longer run but that said uh, in a, there are actually long-term factors that will cause uh, inflation to be on the higher end these are deglobalization uh, second thing you know technology actually drove down prices for you know for, for quite a few years but uh, you know it's reached a diminishing return i.e uh, the the impact of technology on inflation is actually going to be to be less and lastly also china used to be the so-called the factory of the world and they used to actually to export cheap products but um the wages in china is actually uh, getting higher and as such you know um the pricing from china itself is not going to be so deflationary um so inflation probably will go off um ease off but uh, towards a higher level um there's another theme that's out there uh, and which is actually on uh, the environment itself. I think a lot of us probably were heard about uh, COP26 end of last year. A lot of governments talk about, you know, we want to reach uh, carbon neutrality and so on and so forth. So what are the implications for China also? I think there are certain sectors that will face uh, headwinds. For example, power, whereby um, there'll be more capital expenditure, more investments to move away from coal. Remember in China, they are very, um, very heavy, reliant on uh, coal itself. So there will be this transition from uh, fossil fuel into other types of uh, new energy itself. Um, transportation, likewise, you know, the old transportation companies or the whole value chain probably will face headwinds. But you know, you will actually see winners, which which are in the forms of let's say electric vehicles and so on and so forth. Still, um, I think there are you know, uh, steel plants are actually quite, uh, should I say? heavy in terms of uh, carbon emission and uh, a lot of these uh, industries companies will have to invest uh, in uh, uh, new technologies but of course there are also other sectors that actually benefit from this uh, move to to, to uh, green uh, basically let's say you know you look at hydrogen there's a whole value chain of companies that uh, investors can actually invest in 
uh, especially in China when it comes to hydrogen and uh, of course also for sustainable agriculture. So there will be the, this uh, list of companies that uh, people can look at. In the longer run, what we actually want to tell everybody is that actually if you look at the disruptive innovative companies out there, you'll be surprised that uh, or should I say, you know, you won't be surprised that the largest uh, so-called innovator out there is actually US. So if you look at the number of unicorns out there, uh, more than half of that will actually come from the US. But can you guess that the second largest uh, number of unicorns or the second number largest number of uh, so-called innovative companies actually comes from China? So actually disruptive innovation is a very big theme in China. Uh, over here, we just, you know, we don't have the so much time. So I just over here, I just want to introduce to everybody uh, some of the themes that uh, Lion, Global dis uh, uh, Lion Global actually looks at. Uh, over here, we also in, uh, invest in the, these uh, themes itself. Uh, I just now, I actually mentioned that uh, I was the fund manager of the Global Disruptive Innovation Fund at, uh, at Lion Global. So over here, I just list down so-called the disruptive themes that we have identified. And uh, it's also interesting to, to note that, you know, uh, a lot of these themes actually are at different parts of the maturity cycle. And there's a lot of uh, so-called technologies or should I say innovations that are at still at a nascent stage, meaning an early stage. And that means that there will still be a very long, um, long term growth uh, potential for many of these companies that are um, right, uh, that are exposed to these themes itself. So um, maybe just over here is too, too much for me to actually introduce all 16 themes out there. But maybe, you know, I just want to introduce uh, uh, something that has been on top of uh, a lot of investors' mind. And uh, that's this uh, talks about Web 3.0 and also about Metaverse. But basically what that means is that, can it, can it, you know, if you take a step back and you think about it, Web 2.0 is basically, you know, um, us having a so-called a, a social media identity. Uh, and also we can surf the web, we have a social media identity. Uh, a lot of companies can actually target us on Facebook, on Instagram, or on, um, you know, they know who we are, but in a, in a various uh, social media identity, and then they can do marketing to us, they can, you know, so that's uh, Web 2.0. But when it comes to Web 3.0, it actually takes a step or transformation step forward. And in the end, what that means is that, you know, instead of having various different social media identity out there, uh, with problems pertaining to privacy and what have you. In a web 3.0 world, every one of us over here would basically have a one uh, so-called virtual reality identity that is that is unique to us and that we can actually use across all applications out there, which ad we can actually use to work, live and play. Basically, you know, you can buy a movie ticket, you can watch a show, uh, you can do interactions, you can you know, you can even study and, and do whatever you want, visit a museum, go, go, go get something from the library. And this will be where your, uh, so-called virtual reality, uh, uh, so-called identity would be. So this itself is a, is a revolution of the internet or the World Wide web as we know it. And this would probably, uh, fuel the, the growth, uh, for the next, uh, 10 years or so. So this is a very exciting times for. Uh, asked to to actually be investing in the disruptive innovation space with uh, many technologies out there at differing dif different uh, maturity um, part of the cycle itself. Um, okay, and with that, you know, uh, I come to my conclusions. But you know, we can't talk about uh, outlook. You know, if we do not look at uh, valuations and also earnings growth over here, I just want to highlight to everybody. I think the one in blue just shows the so-called the valuation of uh, China. Of course, you know, you can look at price earnings ratio, 12 months forward, meaning that it's a 12 month uh, forecasted numbers. Um, you can look at price earning, you can look look at price to book, you know, uh, enterprise value and so on and so forth. But actually the norm is uh, for people to look at price earnings. Uh, if you look over here, then if you look at compared to the other countries out there, uh, China is actually trading at a relatively more attractive valuation vis-a-vis -vis the other regions out there. US, you know, the premium is actually very high, but you look at China, it's probably around single digit. Earnings growth is very decent, you know? So for a lower valuation, relative valuation, you look at the earnings growth in China, uh, 2022 is around 14%, 2023 around 15, 16% thereabout. But if you look at across the whole spectrum itself, right? Let's say Asia Pacific, Europe, you know, US, the earnings growth is around eight to 9% thereabout. 
uh, is actually lower than uh, the Chinese market. Um, and for a lot of uh, the Singapore investors, you probably were uh, wondering, what about Singapore, right? Singapore is also trading at an attractive level. Uh, if you look at the earnings growth, it's similar to, to China itself. So I come to the conclusion over here. I think that, you know, um, in 2022, we would probably transition from uh, Omicron to a post-COVID world. Likewise, uh, for China itself, there's a possibility that they will move from zero COVID into uh, uh, post-COVID, meaning, you know, a endemic uh, phase in uh, maybe end of 2022 to 2023, right? Uh, second thing is that, you know, just like I've actually mentioned, the Chinese equities market has actually corrected very sharply last year. Um, and with this year, uh, there's this possibility with the government's uh, emphasis on stability and growth itself uh, for the Chinese to say that, you no, know, we will introduce fewer new regulations. We don't need to, to introduce so many new re regulations. And they are currently at the loose, loosening uh, part of the cycle itself in terms of uh, policies. So that would actually bode very well for the Chinese equities market. So we can't tell when the Chinese stock market or the tech sector would actually rebound uh, but that said, you know, the risk rewards in the Chinese market is actually very good. And uh, lastly, just want to draw to everybody's uh, attention that the US market has done very well over the last three years. And obviously, currently you can see the S&P 500, you can see Nasdaq actually doing uh, uh, some corrections over here. We think that would probably continue. The reason behind that is because of the US market and the US tech space have actually benefited greatly. Uh, from the QE that they have put in place and also because of COVID, right? You know, because of COVID, there's this uh, emphasis on uh, tech stocks that actually benefited from COVID. So as we exit from the COVID uh, situation, then uh, a lot, and when we actually withdraw the QE stimuluses that we have, the markets that actually benefited most, which in this case would be the US market, probably wouldn't do well. So just uh, finally, just uh, some... Uh, comments from us on the markets itself. We think that, you know, as uh, 2022, we move to a post-COVID world, we probably will see uh, the markets that have actually underperformed and that are more cyclical in nature, like Singapore, Japan, probably will do okay. Um, the Chinese market will also do well, uh, like for the reasons that I've actually uh, mentioned before. And uh, lastly, you know, regardless of all the markets out there, if you look on a sector basis, um, in the longer run, we are actually positive on the uh, disruptive innovation itself. Uh, lastly, you know, this is a disclaimer itself. Uh, and I actually want to make uh, some comments, a little bit of comments on the so-called the Ukraine-Russia uh, situation out there. Just want to say that, you know, it's the most unfortunate uh, event. Uh, by that aside, you know, we are specialists in the uh, financial market. So we want to comment on the implications to, to financial uh, instruments itself. We think that it will impact uh, the European uh, economy much more than other regions. That's the first key, uh, key takeaway. And second thing, uh, basically, uh, the crisis in uh, Ukraine, the so-called the, the the contagion mechanism, or should I say, you know, how it actually affects other markets actually basically through commodities. So that is through high oil prices, uh, high food inflation, because uh, Ukraine and uh, Russia actually exports a lot of uh, wheat fertilizers and so on and so forth. Uh, they are also, uh, Russia is also ex a key exporter for uh, oil, 10% of it. They are also a major exporters for nickel um, and uh, some like palladium and some of these uh, 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 so-called uh, metals out there. So the, the so-called transmission mechanism would basically be uh, through uh, commodities itself. And uh, these are uh, areas that probably will impact uh, uh, China uh, less than, let's say, in Europe and uh, also in countries that actually, you know, uh, are actually, you know, in short of uh, of uh, natural gas or, let's say, you know, uh, oil itself. So with that, you know, I end my presentation and I pass it back to uh, Don. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Shreen. Thank you very much for sharing uh, your insights on the China market outlook with us. Uh, just give me a sec. Hmm. 
Okay, so well, thanks very much, uh, Yun, for sharing. Uh, you know, he's very insightful uh, China market outlook with us for 2022. Uh, so while Yun has elaborated and explained, you know, our house view for China for 2022 and beyond, I'm just going to quickly run through some of the few uh, long-term structural, uh, pretty much evergreen growth trends of China uh, that support our thesis of the line OCBC Securities China Leaders ETF. Uh, to refresh, this ETF was launched last year as a way to help investors like yourself gain access and tap into the very exciting growth opportunities uh, by Ch in China that Yun has so kindly elaborated for us. So basically, the, 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 um, the, the two key anchors of the ETF is foundation and innovation. And what exactly do we mean by that? Traditional blue chip players are what we call the foundation of China's growth. And we're talking about banks, real estate, commodity sector. And all of this have been turbocharged by this new innovation that we are seeing. And also by a lot of all these tech players that are coming up again, are very similar to what Yun mentioned about all these disruptive innovation trends that we're seeing seeing happening in China as we speak. And a lot of these companies are leaders, not just in China, but also global leaders in their respective sectors that we hope to capture this growth potential via our LAN OCBC Securities China Leaders ETF. So why China? These are some of you know, the key long-term statistics that I will just briefly touch and go. Uh, so China, again, too big to ignore. It's the second largest economy in the world. And all the signs are pointing to the rise of China as the next economic superpower. As you can see from the chart on the left, it is just shy of the US. And in fact, ahead of many developed countries, Japan, Germany, UK, India, and France, right? So this is, uh, you know, numbers speak for themselves. And if you zoom in the history of China, which is on the right-hand side, we can see how its growth has compounded about 12% year on year for 35 years now. And not surprising, China is expected to lead the world with the highest GDP growth potential in the next few years. So other than being the world's second largest economy, China is also the world's second largest stock market. At the end of 2020, as you can see from the chart, uh, it is just behind US again, and in fact, ahead of Japan. So now we have our innovation portion of the ETF, um, backed by a growing and very resilient economy. There are many uh, catalysts that would drive the long-term equities performance of China. And here I will highlight four key catalysts. And first of which is the domestic consumption in China, which we believe is the cornerstone of China's economy. As of 2020, China has a middle class population of 344 million. And to put that into perspective, because perspective is important, it is double the size of US middle class and in fact larger than the entire US population. So these numbers just keep growing, right? And with such a bungeoning middle class uh, with rising consumption power, we do believe that that's going to be the anchor of China's economy. Second, demographic trends. We're seeing this big shift of China's consumption uh, to more service kind of oriented economy, right? As you can imagine, uh, in a world, it took centuries for the world to shift from agriculture to manufacturing. And now we are seeing a huge radical shift uh, towards higher value added services. And surely this has transformed the composition of the world's economic production, employment, and trading patterns. So as the disposable income of middle class grow, as you can see on the right-hand side of the chart, uh, we do believe that many service um, industries, such as in the financial sector, healthcare, insurance, education, will all benefit from this. And all these sectors are captured in our line OCBC China Leaders ETF. China's digital economy, again, you know, I would like to tie this back to what Yun has mentioned earlier in his presentation, where we strongly believe in a disruptive growth trends that is also happening in China and globally, of course, a kind of a long-term structural story, right? I mean, the pandemic, no doubt, accelerated the move into the digital world. We have now the metaverse, the new buzzword. Uh, Facebook changed its name to Meta Incorporated uh, because there's so many uh, transformational new opportunities in the digital economy globally and also in China. 
So just to bring it back to topic for China, if you look at the charts here, uh, China's digital economy has grown 4x from 2011 to 2000, 2020. So that's a huge number, right? That is 17% year-on-year growth compounded for nine years, right? So here are some of the stats you can see on the right-hand side, uh, which we are not, I'm not going to go into it. But again, you know, keywords, right, that we keep seeing on the news, internet users, online shoppers, online payment users, digital development, etc. Next, opening of capital markets. Again, I'm going to touch and go. But you can see that China has been very active in reforming and opening up its capital markets to attract capital and growth. And of course, this is, you know, very important. I mean, closer to home be like Singapore, right? I mean, we open up our, our FDI and open up our capital markets. The inclusion of China in MSCI EM index is also a very, uh, is also a very key milestone that will enable it to continue to attract significant capital inflows into China A shares. And here again, a picture speaks a thousand words. Uh, Stock Connect investment opportunities have a lot of technical support for both the A and H shares. Foreign ownership in China equities has traditionally been very low, but back to the point that China over the last few years has been uh, very actively opening up its uh, equity market. So you can see low but growing. What does it mean? Upside potential, massive. Diversification benefit, um, you know, diversification benefit, i.e. China, uh, especially, you know, again, bring back to what Green said, uh, you know, there's a lot of turmoil going on in the world, right? And don't put your eggs in one basket. And China has always shown quite low correlation uh, with some of the uh, bigger names like the US. So by making allocations to China A shares, you're able to diversify uh, some of the risk away. So in summary, what do we see? We see a huge, compelling growth story in China, supported by very strong economic fundamentals, solid companies, and an excellent beta opportunity. So here, I'm just going to delve in quickly into some of the key details um, of the LAN OCBC Security China Leaders ETF, where you can gain access to 80 China market giants. Uh, this is an exclusive collaboration uh, within Lion and the OCBC group. So it is a full replication of the Hang Seng Stock Connect AT index. Each security has been kept at 8% and each sector at 40% to ensure diversification across sectors and individual stocks. And a very, very important point um, I would like to highlight to investors is that this is the first China-focused ETF that will make a distribution in Singapore. Again, I repeat, this is the first China-focused ETF that will make a distribution in Singapore, listed on the Singapore Stock Exchange. You know, Singapore investors generally have a slight bias towards dividend, right? Because we love REITs, we like a yield, and we believe that this will surely satisfy that need. Index methodology, uh, this is going to be a bit uh, technical. So um, I'm again going to touch and go. There's a huge universe to filter, uh, which is 1,900 stocks, right? And then from 1,900 stocks, we've filtered it down to 80 constituents uh, that you see uh, in the index today. And they have many, many uh, different criteria to fulfill. But uh, be rest assured that the most eligible 80 stocks ranked by market value uh, will be included in the index. So indeed, a very, very robust framework. Here gives you a flavor of the sector breakdown and also the different various exchanges, uh, share types, back a pardon, across the different exchanges. So here, the top 10, uh, 20 constituents, uh, many of are very household names. So you kind of know what you're investing in, right? Everyone wants to know what exactly we are holding. Uh, we have names like Tencent, uh, Guizhou Maltai, Pingan Insurance, and Cat L. You know, Guizhou Maltai, again, very interesting, a very uh, premium liquor drink. That's also getting popularity among the uh, the youngsters. It's a very premium upmarket brand. Again, goes with the story. Remember, as I say, uh, growing middle class, rising disposable income. Another constituent is Cat L, which is the fourth circle. Uh, Ningte Shidai, it is the largest EV battery manufacturer. Uh, it supplies batteries to many powerhouses like Tesla, right? Again, you know, Yun mentioned earlier in his presentation that we have this EV trend, uh, the COP26 that he, that he also mentioned. It's obviously a very important milestone uh, last year. Uh, because of low carbon footprint, we are moving towards a low carbon economy. Uh, there's increasing urgency agency for us as a society to move towards net zero or to tackle climate change and this name plays perfectly into the theme. 
So uh, here's going to just be my ending slide to kind of round up and sum up these key value propositions of our China Leaders ETF. So through this ETF, you can immediately gain exposure to 80 China market giants that again are backed by strong foundation that are fostering transformation and innovation. And with less than 10 Sing dollars, you can now participate in China's growth story. Uh, you can access this ETF by logging into your broker's trading account or searching uh, YYY, easy to remember, triple Y uh, for the Singapore dollar counter and YYR for the RMB counter. So with that, uh, we end our presentation and we are very happy to take questions. Thank you very much. So I think um, on this, uh, the Q&A, um, as what is actually shown on the screen, you can either scan the QR code um, or you can go directly to this, <clears throat> to the website uh, and you can enter the password and then uh, we have uh, some time to take questions uh, now. Okay, uh, so here I have the first question. Um, I, I think I should I read it out to okay, maybe uh, I should I just think, read it out, right? Okay, sure, yeah, I'll, I'll read it out. I think this is this will be for you. Okay, so um, I'll just read it out for everybody's benefit in case you guys are not actually looking at the screen. Uh, so the first question is, uh, what is the risk to growth in 2022 if China's endemic COVID transition happens uh, in a disorderly manner like what's happening to Hong Kong? I think the, uh, you know, China is basically a so-called planned uh, economy. Uh, like just now I mentioned, um, the CWC uh, policy meeting last year, end of last year, December, basically that sets the national agenda for the uh, the whole country in 2022. Uh, the keyword over there is stability. Uh, we think that with COVID, with uh, be it you know uh, the disruptions within the uh, at the so-called Russia Ukraine side, or you know even with uh, a slowdown in the economy in uh, Europe. The, the Chinese is probably determined to maintain a certain uh, growth level. Uh, of course, they have not mentioned what is the so-called uh, the GDP growth rate that they will, they would you know they they would uh, uh, defend. But uh, it is a uh, market expectations that it, it will be around five percent. So that's a long way to to actually to answer your question. Uh, basically, what that means is that you know the risk of a very drastic slowdown in China is probably quite low. Uh, the reason behind that also because the Chinese government has a lot of policy tools that they can put, they can actually use. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Thanks very much. Um, this is the second question, um, which is, I think Yuna has briefly mentioned it just now, but uh, why not for the benefit of everyone since it's pretty much topical now, right? Yep. Uh, how does the uh, current Russian-Ukraine conflict um, affect the Chinese markets? Yeah, so basically, you know, the the direct impact of uh, this conflict itself is obviously more to the, the consumption patterns uh, in terms of uh, higher... Um, natural gas prices, oil prices in uh, Europe itself. And obviously, you know, if you're next to a country that's uh, going into war, uh, the consumption or the, should I say the confidence level in the country it would actually not be very high. So that will actually impact uh, Europe and also the neighboring countries around uh, Russia and Ukraine a lot more than the US or Europe or, or maybe in Asia itself. So the impact, you know, e economic impact on, let's say on China, um, the direct impact is actually quite low. The the basic so-called transmission mechanism is through higher commodity prices. So that's in terms of oil, uh, natural gas, and you talk about commodities like nickel and, so, and palladium and so on and so forth. But actually, you know, if you look at that, um, the you know, it's not a very politically correct thing to say, but, you know, for, for the Chinese themselves, they are actually very pragmatic people. Uh, i.e. although there's COP26, they talk about uh, long-term 
uh, carbon neutrality, which means that they will eventually phase out uh, this, uh, let's say, usage of coal for, for power uh, generation. But that said, right, for short term purposes, when oil prices are really high, uh, the Chinese actually have got a lot of coal, pl coal plants, power plants, they can actually fire them up, uh, increase the, the capacity itself, and that actually eases off uh, the impact of uh, high energy costs on them. Uh, so actually the Chinese, in a way, they are more flexible, uh, they are less susceptible to all these issues. The second thing that people talk about would be this uh, uh, financial um, uh, sanctions and what have you on, on, on uh, Russia itself. Again, you know, Actually, in the longer run, what that means is that um, a lot of countries out there that are worried that you know they might get sanctioned, you know, by the U.S. government if if there are some conflicts or what have you, uh, all these countries will probably be looking at uh, creating their own or following uh, other uh, financial systems other than the SWIFT system, and that would actually mean uh, the Chinese system. So, in the very long run, in the area of uh, let's say if you talk about the area of uh, of uh, let's say payment system itself, I think the Chinese payment system is also going to become a lot more uh, important out there. So actually not a very politically correct thing to say, but, but uh, you know, the, uh, it's very unfortunate uh, for the uh, people who are involved in the war itself. But then again, uh, China is actually a indirect beneficiary of this. Yep. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, maybe I'll take the easy question and give you a break, whether we can use uh, what the different modes of payment for the ETF. Uh, so IE, can we use SRS or CPF? Uh, so the index was listed in uh, on 2nd August last year. So as of this point, you can use both cash and SRS to purchase the ETF um, units. But unfortunately, CPF is currently still not an available uh, mode of subscription. Uh, so yeah, the answer is... Um, uh, cash and SRS at the moment. Okay, so there's a, another question on what sectors do we like in uh, China itself? Well, mm -hmm. um, just now I, I think in one of my slides, I actually show the, you know, there are sectors that actually will face policy headwinds. There are also sectors that would uh, face uh, policy tailwinds. So what that means is that the Chinese government says that we want to have sustainable growth and we want to be self-sufficient in uh, certain things like technology and what have you, right? So when they say that, they are basically more referring to the hardware side. So certain industries like, let's say, Semicon, uh, they are also also focusing on uh, on uh, manufacturing. So you can talk about industrial, uh, robotics and what have you. So these are sectors that basically will face uh, policy uh, tailwinds, meaning that the government is actually very supportive. So naturally, they are they, they should actually do okay. But that's it, right? The sectors that have actually sold off a lot, you know, so in this case would, would uh, be uh, the tech stocks, um, the platform companies and so on and so forth. These are sectors where I actually mentioned they face uh, regulatory headwinds. Uh, the government says that, oh, no, I don't want uh, companies to be monopolistic, right? So they put in, case, in place certain rules. Uh, they also say that I don't want my people to, my kids to, to be always playing games, right? So they put in place certain restrictions. So when these restrictions are all put in place, they are now satisfied and they say that, oh, okay, you know, uh, we, we are done with uh, introduction of new regulations. Then from there will be more certainty for the for the companies, for these sectors, right? So that's when the sectors, the, the, the stock prices over there would actually bottom out. So basically, we are also not negative on the, the tech space. We, we think that the tech space sometime probably this year uh, would actually bottom out. So some sectors... Um, like this, right? Um, I think uh, property sector, we think the recovery will be will be a lot longer. The reason is because that would, you know, they still want to prevent a bubble in the property market itself. Uh, and as such, you know, um, they might ease on the margin itself for the property stocks. Uh, but that said, right, you know, uh, we think that the recovery over here will probably take a, a much longer period of time. Yeah, and it's great that, of course, you know, the ETF is diversified across, you know, the different sectors and we have 80 constituents kept at 8% each and each sector being kept at, you know, 40%. So it does hedge up some of the risk and, uh, you know, obviously helps in diversification. Okay, so maybe I can also answer one of which is, uh, what if there's a decoupling of the capital market, whether Euro and US, 
would become more distant to China and China is left with Russia? The answer is actually probably uh, no. I, I think you know one way to look at it is actually you know the usage of uh, the the US currency is probably I don't know, you know around uh, upper fifty percent uh, globally. So it's a reserve currency out there. Um, then you have got euro, you got yen, and then uh, obviously others will be you know uh, Chinese renminbi included. Chinese renminbi currently maybe two and a half percent there about is being used. Uh, the expectation is that you know it will be used a lot more uh, by various countries. Also, the, the percentage will actually go up. Um, so you will actually have uh, various uh, so-called currencies that are being being used. There'll be uh, various uh, so-called systems that could actually be used. So in the payment system itself, we can think about SWIFT and then uh, you can talk about the Chinese system also. Uh, they probably, they would coexist. So it, it wouldn't be a case whereby, you know, there's only uh, one system or the other system itself. Yeah, I think, I think that's what it is. I think when you say over here, decoupling, you know, um, originally there's already various systems out there, right? You know, there's a SWIFT system. There's a Chinese have their own system. Russians obviously have their own system also. But just that it's not very much used the other system are not not uh, so rampantly used, but going forward, you know, the Chinese system could actually be used a lot more. Yep. So that would actually be positive for China itself. Mm, thank you very much. Okay, so I'll be running a little bit. Um, we're kind of running a little bit over eight, but um, I'm just looking at all the questions here, and they seem to be very geared on dividends. So maybe I'll just answer all of them uh, together as kind of a last rounding uh, statements. <laughs> Uh, so for the ETF, as I mentioned, uh, we do actually make a dividend uh, distribution. Uh, the distribution policy is annual and is going to be, um, will be actually be in June this year because the ETF was listed in August last year, right? So the dividend rate and a record, a record rate will be, will be announced in June this year. There's no expected or, or guaranteed dividend yield for the ETF. Um, however, today I checked the index, which is the Hang Seng Stock Connect 80, just earlier today at say 4 p.m. Uh, the indicative uh, trailing 12-month dividend yield of the index, which is Hang Seng Stock Connect 80 index, uh, was 2.36% on Bloomberg. So, uh, you know, that could kind of give us a guidance, right? But again, uh, it's not expected and it's not guaranteed. And of course, uh, it could possibly change. And uh, just a little bit on the expense ratio and the management fee. Um, uh, the total expense ratio is 0.62% uh, kept at the first two years of the inception and the management fee will be 0.45%. Um, the fact sheet is available on our website. You can, I guess, uh, you, it's available on our website. We do have a, a web page that is dedicated to the line OCBC China Leaders um, ETF. Um, and for the ticker symbol for the Singapore counter is YYY, triple Y, easy to remember. And for the RMB counter is YYR. Um, and with that said, uh, we are slightly after 8 o'clock. Uh, I believe there are actually still quite a lot of questions coming in. Uh, but unfortunately, I think we may have to end there. But please uh, feel free to reach out to us at uh, Line Global Investors. Uh, our website is also available. You can send in your questions or reach out to any of your brokers or sales reps to send the questions to us. And Dream is, of course, you know, available um, as Chief Investment Strategist to answer any of your market outlook questions. So, well, thank you again very, very much to everyone for dialing in and listening to us and to Singapore Exchange for hosting us and giving us an opportunity to share our views um, and the product with all of you. So, again, thank you so much. I'm Dawn from Line Global Investors and uh, Lim Rin from Line Global Investors as well. Uh, have a great evening, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.